This is Faith in Action, the program that looks at how people put their faith into action in their everyday lives. Faith in Action is a production of Catholic Radio Indy. Now here's today's program. This is Faith in Action on Catholic Radio Indy. I'm Kent Blanford in studio with me, Bridget Eyre, and we are blessed to have on the phone a very familiar voice on the EWTN network and uh, a very learned man whom we're going to tap into for uh, information on how a Catholic votes in an election year. Absolutely. And our guest today is Father Mitch Pacwell. Welcome to Faith in Action. Thank you very much. It's a delight to be with y'all. And you are a definitely a spiritual and theological heavyweight, so this is really awesome that you, you're here today. And, and you have all these titles, and I, you can correct me if I have any of these wrong. You're the president and founder of Ignatius Productions. You are the yes, se- senior fellow of, of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, and you're also um, host of EWTN Live. So, And Father Mitch Pacwa, yeah, yeah. Will, you will be unpacking all these election uh, things that are happening and um, how Catholics should approach the election, I guess, from a Catholic perspective. So uh, Mm -hmm. why is this election so important? There there are a number of reasons for that. Um, On one hand, we have seen the uh, upping the ante with, both the coronavirus coming into play and it being turned very much into a political issue. Secondly, we also see that the um, rioting in the streets is a heavily political issue, as is to be expected, uh, and it's not merely about people who are disgruntled. It's writing by people who want to see a radical change in the culture and the government. And they want that not on the basis of principle, but on the basis of their own demands. Now, they do have principles. I don't want to imply that there are no principles behind Antifa and Black Lives Matter, but they do not allow discussion, and any disagreement eradicates freedom of speech, so that then it's not only, as I say, not only a change in culture, but also a change in government, so that issues like freedom of speech are at stake. As, uh, for instance, in recent news, uh, a couple who were defending their lives and their property from one of these groups in St. Louis is now has now been indicted but the people who came onto the property made threats and also had firearms were not indicted this, this is also putting the second amendment and the right to defend one's life and property at risk we see a, a variety of questions about the meaning of life, the meaning of the economy, um, all of the, and the effectiveness of the economy, all of these are at stake. Plus, uh, besides all those overarching issues, the personalities of the candidates with their strengths and weaknesses are at the forefront. Instead of arguing on principles, Folks are also deciding on the basis of whether they like one candidate or dislike the other one, rather than on the issues, because a lot of times too many folks cannot even address the issues because they don't know how to think them through. They're voting oftentimes emotionally rather than logically. And again, this is something that is said to be good 
by certain parts of the society, that you don't think about these things and get information, follow your gut reaction, which is usually dumb. Well, Father Mitch, I want to ask you, you mentioned about tolerance and free speech, and mm-hmm. when I hear, think about more intolerance, I, I'm, I'm recalling, I believe it was Pope Benedict uh, who talked about moral relativism as a very intolerant dictator. Do you want to touch on that real uh, briefly? Sure. It, 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 this is one of the most important things to understand about the, the cultural uh, challenge today. If you do not believe in truth, if you do not believe that there is such a thing as right or wrong, then you are a relativist, right? Mm -hmm. And that means that I have my truth, you have your truth, and we'll just agree to disagree and let each other move along. That sounds fairly positive, right? Mm -hmm. Until you come to an intersection and you have to decide who goes through the intersection first. Mm -hmm. If I have my truth, then my need to get to my uh, uh, destination quickly outweighs your need for whatever silly thing you must be doing, so I should go first. And I don't care about the stop sign or the red light. I'm going through it, and you just stand back, because I have my truth. The other person might say the same thing. In such a world, who ultimately decides who goes through the intersection first? Basically, the person with the uh, SUV or the Humvee goes through the intersection before the Prius. Gotcha. (laughs) Because power makes you right. If you have the power, then you do what you want. This is the ultimate value in a relativistic world. Then... Take a look at that principle. I use that as an example. Everybody can say, yeah, of course, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You have to come up with some other principle so that the Humvee and the Prius are on an equal footing. Mm -hmm. Namely, everybody obeys the stop sign or the stoplight. And the person who arrives first at uh, uh, that's on the right, if people arrive at the same time, the one on the right goes through first. That's These are simple principles we learn in driver's ed. Now, take a look at the political discourse. Whoever can shout the loudest and shout down or intimidate all opposition is the one who is going to be heard. That's the principle of a relativistic culture, because there's no objective truth Therefore, there is no truth between you and me. And therefore, we have no basis for a discussion. If there is no objective truth, and there is no truth that we recognize together, we cannot develop an argument for or against our position. I have to shout you down. Shut up. Listen to me. Remember Senator Hirono of Hawaii, who said, it's time for you men to shut up, stand up, and I don't know what. You know, what, you, what do you want us to do? Shut up, stand up? No, but she's just shouting out orders. Right. and that's... Instead of helping us argue uh, reasonably to a correct form of action. This is true at the pol- highest levels of politics, and it's true on the streets of our cities right now. And, Father Mitch, that's why I wanted to bring up moral relativism, because I think that definitely sheds light at, onto where we're at right now in our society. That's kind, yep. of, that's kind of the underlying thing that's causing a lot of 
unrest. I, I want to get yep. to Catholic social teaching. Could, well, could, could I just mention one other thing sure. that I think is also key here? Think back on the discussion that President Obama introduced in his first term, namely that the Constitution is an 18th century uh, uh, document that must be updated and that we have to focus on the rights of the government, not the rights of the individual, because that's what the Constitution does. It focuses on the rights of the individual to protect it from the government. Mm-hmm. He wanted to switch. Think about that principle as applying to what's going on in Congress today. That the Democrats and the Republicans disagree vehemently on what the Constitution means for them. Mm-hmm. So the Supreme Court invented a uh, right to privacy. Now everybody thinks there's a right to privacy in the uh, uh, Constitution. There is not. They made that up. Mm-hmm. In, a, in a decision in 1965 uh, against the uh, state of Connecticut from Planned Parenthood, they say that the right to privacy exists in the penumbra of the emanations of the rights stated in the Bill of Rights. That's a direct quote from the Supreme Court. What does that mean? That the right to privacy exists in the shadows of emanations of the rights. There's nothing in the Constitution about emanations of rights or penumbra, the shadows. It's just not stated. So they made this gobbledygook statement up, and everybody accepts it. That is so different from the position of you follow the Constitution as it's written. And this inability to resolve what do we accept from the Constitution, what do we reject, that is why Congress yells, screams, and threatens, and all this, and they don't get much done as a result. That's dictatorship of relativism. I think we're going to go ahead and take a break right now. When we come back, we're going to talk about the issues. Is abortion more important than other issues? We're going to talk about the common good, prudential judgment. We'll get to as much as we can with Father Mitch, so stay tuned for more. You're listening to Catholic Radio Indy, converting the culture to Christ through radio, featuring 100% Catholic programming 24-7. Do your friends a favor. Tell them about Catholic Radio Indy. Have you ever thought about joining the Catholic Church? Have you just wanted to explore the Catholic faith? All you need to do is call your local Catholic Church for more information. We are always happy to help you in your journey to discover and learn more about the Catholic faith. We have classes that are almost year-round, and the classes and information sessions do not involve making a commitment, and there is no pressure to join. Please call your local Catholic parish for more information today and start the journey of one day possibly becoming Catholic as well. God bless. You can hear the Holy Mass every day at 8 a.m. right here on Catholic Radio Indy. Welcome back to Faith in Action. I'm Bridget Ayer. Kent Blanford is in the studio with me, and we're talking with Father Mitch Pacwa, and we're talking about the election and how Catholics should approach it. Now, before we took a break, we were talking about the right to privacy, which was basically somewhat invented by the court in, I think you said, 1965. and which, that was it. Which led the way to uh, Roe v. Wade and the uh, right mm-hmm. to an abortion. Let's talk about abortion as an issue for Catholics going forward. Mm-hmm. Is that a preeminent issue? Is it equal to other issues like the death penalty or the environment or poverty? How would you unpack the abortion issue as, it come, as we come into the election? I take a look at it as what it is, a life and death issue. This is a question of whether certain people live or die. Is that, is that basic? And uh, as uh, the, the Church has made very clear, that if you do not have the right to life, None of your other rights matter. You're dead. How can you expect to have 
any other rights if you are dead. It's just that basic and simple. And this is something that uh, all of us uh, very much need to understand about the right to life. That are we going to be uh, able to protect lives of innocent people? Um, now, when you look at the decision for abortion uh, that was made by the Supreme Court, um, which was uh, nine men deciding the fates of uh, millions, you know, about 60 million children. And uh, a lot of times people try to make this, well, you know, women should make this decision. Well, actually, it was nine men who made this decision. True. And then we have to take a look at some of their principles here, because they themselves admitted that they decided this partly because they were afraid of overpopulation. That what one of the judges had read the population bomb by Paul Ehrlich that had said that if the population is not reduced by uh, 19... Uh, you know, within the 70s, then by the 1980s, there will be mass starvation. That And the, the judge said, I thought that was really going to happen, and I was scared. So that indicates that he made his decision on false science. Because as we know, 1985 has come and gone, we do not have the 14 billion people they said it would, there would be. We do not have mass starvation. The only places where there is starvation is where politicians have inserted themselves into the economy, like in Somalia. But other than, than those places, there's no starvation, nor is there need for starvation, because there is an abundance of food. So it's false but it still was a basis for making a decision in the court instead of the Constitution. So what we have to do is demand that our presidents lay out what, what kind of judge they are going to choose. I am very, very concerned, concerned that Vice President Biden still will not release a list of potential judges. That's very con disconcerting. You, it reminds me of Nancy Pelosi saying that let's pass the health care bill and then we'll see what's in it. That's not how you work in a democracy. In a democracy, the people who vote need to be well-informed. If the voters are not informed, how can they make good decisions? The answer is they cannot. They make emotional decisions, and the politicians hide things. We can remember Mr. Nixon had hidden the bombing of Cambodia and Laos from the American people. Had they known that, they may have voted very differently against him in 72. That yep. these politicians think they can get away with hiding things, and that, that's just not correct. We have to know what they're up to. Because as with the bombing of Cambodia, the abortion issue is a life and death issue. And we have to distinguish those issues that are moral issues of life and death, or as in the case in the 1800s, when the Catholic bishops were silent in speaking out against slavery 
even though Pope Gregory the Sixteenth in eighteen thirty nine published a papal bull telling bishops around the world to speak out against slavery, following what the popes had been teaching about slavery for the hundreds of years since the slave trade in the Atlantic began. They condemned it. And despite that condemnation, they remained silent. And I would say this, bishops who choose not to place a priority on teaching us that the right to life and abortion is an essential question, not periphery, then they are just as guilty as the American bishops of the 1830s and 40s who were silent about slavery when the Pope was telling them, this is our value, we are against slavery, and you must not do anything to support it. Meanwhile, the bishops were telling President James Polk that, oh, don't worry about this, the Pope's just saying this stuff, but it doesn't mean anything. We hear the same kind of argument from some of the bishops in the issue of life and death of tens of millions of our children. And, you know, and even when religious and some of my Jesuit brothers say, oh, this issue of abortion is a negotiable, it's not as important as all the other issues, they cannot, for, they must not forget that some of them in at Georgetown University, were selling their slaves off before the Pope made them do so, so you get a better price, and make sure that they kept the university going, and so, and they broke up families. It was an evil that infuriated the Pope and made them haul themselves over to Rome to deal with penance for disobedience. So, you know, Father Mitch, you're... We you're, cannot you're, be people who neglect these moral issues. We have to address them. So you're saying abortion is a preeminent issue? It's, it, the bishops have said at the USCCB it's the number one issue. Okay, that's what I was just trying to get death. at. Okay, let me. It's life and death. Absolutely. Okay, now I want to I want to move on because I got I got a I got a couple other questions I got to get in here. We got about sure. about seven minutes left here. Um, so go ahead. how can Catholics how can or should Catholics prepare before they go into the voting booth? Uh, what kind of can Catholic social teaching shed a light on this? And um, yeah. do they have an obligation to vote? What what role do Catholics play in the public square? The, the Catholics who neglect their obligation to vote in a democratic republic such as ours, because we're not really a democracy, we're a democratic republic, to understand that those who neglect to take up their duty to vote are as the catechism would say, sinning against the fourth commandment. The commandment to honor our parents is also a commandment to deal with our nation, in which all of our relatives and all of our human family live. So we have an obligation, a moral obligation, to vote unless we're sick or dying or something. But we have that obligation. Don't say, oh, I just give up. No, become informed and go to multiple sources, check out the different politicians, demand answers on various topics, and especially on the moral topics, because people, you know, I I don't want to go that far, but um, we, we have to say that it's more than just whether I like people and such, we have to be informed on the issues. Also, pay attention to local elections. Who are the judges? Most citizens have more contact with the local judges than they ever have with the big, sexier issues of the president, the governor, the senators. Those are the big politicians you will probably never meet. Try to find out what you can about local judges. And as they see in St. Louis, the um, district attorneys, because folks are trying to, uh, out from New York City, are financing district attorneys who will not prosecute criminals. This is you know, horrendous. And the, you know, criminals need to be taken off the street 
but with a just process. Make sure that the judges and DAs are good uh, people who know the law and follow the law. Know your mayors and your council people. The, uh, we need to be informed because that is our obligation. And in this time of COVID, we should have more time to investigate these individuals rather than watching binge shows from Netflix or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point. Well, I want to throw out uh, to our audience, uh, the United States Catholic Conference of Bis Bishops has a document called Faithful Citizenship. You can go there for that guy. That will can give, give you some um, insight into Catholic social teaching and what issues are um, relevant and how to prepare. Um, Father, could you, I'll give you a last word here, and then I would love for you to give us a blessing before we go. Sure, sure. Um, no. I hope that we Catholics shine in these issues because so much is at stake for the poor, for our, our nation, for our police, our poor citizens. All of these are at stake. Let's take that all very seriously so that justice, as defined by Aristotle and other great thinkers, as giving to everybody what is their proper due, that that kind of justice is accomplished in our society, and we do so because it's a virtue that God ordains for us to have. That's awesome. And Father, could you give us a blessing? May the Lord bless you all and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father Mitch Pacwa, thank you so much for being our guest. We've got a lot to think about. And vote. Yeah, yeah. God will. All right. You have been listening to Faith in Action, the program that looks at how people put their faith into action in their everyday lives. Faith in Action is a presentation of Catholic Radio Indy. You can hear this episode of Faith in Action again or any past episode at catholicradioindy.org. If you have a suggestion for a guest or topic for a future program, please call us at 317-870-8400 or email jim at catholicradioindy.org.